ponderosapine and forests that have a, uh, a component of ponderosapine, by the time you get to where you're in a pure ponderosapine stand, a, a ponderosapine forest, the owls are, are no longer present. When you get out of a forest that has a significant component of Douglas fir, you're starting to get out of spotted owl habitat. Goshawk on a nest. Uh, Goshawk is uh, uh, present in um, most of these forests that have spotted owls, except in the coast ranges of Oregon. The goshawk is absent in the coast ranges. But uh, old goshawk nests are commonly uh, usurped by uh, spotted owls as nest sites. It's an interesting one because goshawks are also a uh, occasional predator on spotted owls. Sometimes, in some places, uh, spotted owls don't use great huge trees. Uh, this is taken in the vicinity of Fresno, California on the Sierra National Forest. I believe this is a, a blue oak tree and the nest site was either right in there or I think it's right there. Not a very big tree. It was in a, uh, used a cavity in there. Uh, however, the age of that tree is uh, perhaps just as, uh, just as old as some of those uh, big old dug firs uh, further north in the, in the animal's uh, range. This was, uh, by the way, a California subspecies, not the northern subspecies. Very frequently, there are two young uh, produced. Uh, next most common uh, group size of fledging is one. Very occasionally, we'll get three. Uh, the, uh, we've tried adding animals. Once in a while, we'll come upon a, an orphaned uh, bird or a, a youngster that someone has uh, taken in captivity. We've taken them back out and placed them with a uh, pair of owls in the wild and the owls, uh, the uh, nesting owls will adopt an additional youngster just very easily. We've marked a number of these youngsters when they're a little bit older than they were in that last photograph and uh, looked at uh, how do they disperse from their nest sites. It's a real important piece of biological information as we try and devise a management strategy for the animal. We need to know how far apart it's appropriate to space appropriate habitat for the animal. We want to make sure that the youngsters can be expected to have a reasonable chance of dispersing from one patch of suitable habitat and having an opportunity to encounter another suitable patch. This I think uh, represents the dispersal tracks of about 26 young spotted owls. Uh, the purpose of uh, displaying it is to uh, indicate that there's no apparent directional uh, attribute to this, other than this bunch up here. Uh, that, by the way, is the H.J. Andrews area, right about where my pointer is, and they pretty uniformly headed downstream along the Mackenzie River, but the uh, rest of the animals, as far as we can tell, were dispersing in a, essentially a random fashion. Uh, this is uh, Western Oregon. This is Crater Lake National Park. Each of those little squares, if you can make them out, is a township in size, so they're that's uh, 36 square miles inside each of the squares like that. Six miles on a side. Yeah, there's my scale. If you're into kilometers, it's uh, 30 kilometers up there. Uh, I'm not very good at uh, converting kilometers right now yet. How far do those uh, little fellows go when you put a radio on them? Well, they go quite, a lot of them go quite a long ways. The average dispersal distance here, mean, was something on the order of about 17 miles. Some of them went a long ways. Uh, 50 miles there was uh, not uncommon. Since then, we've had a couple of uh, records where uh, birds have gone uh, as far as 90 miles. They don't go in a straight line, which I showed nice straight vectors uh, previously. Uh, here's a, a more typical one. The bird originated at a nest site here. By the 12th of October, it had settled for the winter. Uh, this, again, these represent uh, six by six uh, mile areas, so it had made, oh, uh, 14, uh, perhaps 18 miles uh, down here. The next spring, breeding season, I suppose sap was rising and it might have attempted a hoot and probably found that he was perched too close to a resident pair of owls and got asked to leave and uh, started uh, dispersing again ended up here by the 14th of April, down to here by the 22nd of June, and at that point we lost contact with the animal. Here's a more straight line dispersal. 
animals started on the 4th of November up pretty high in the Cascades and essentially came right straight down the Mackenzie River and did it in, uh, you know, pretty rapidly so that by the, uh, what, the 13th of November was down here uh, just outside of Springfield, Oregon, stopped. Uh, right about at this point is the edge of the Willamette Valley. We've never had one of the birds uh, transit out across the Willamette Valley. They all stopped on the, when they got down here and uh, the 9th of December, that bird was dead. Uh, that's what happened to a pretty high proportion of the birds. Uh, lots of them were found like this, uh, starvation. The next most common uh, cause of death was predation. Uh, great horned owl being the instrument of, uh, of demise for uh, most of the predation that we were able to document. I don't think we're very surprised at uh, those sources of, of mortality. If you had to guess what would kill a inexperienced young animal, I think all of us would have suggested that probably they're either not going to be adept at making a, a living and they're going to starve to death or they're going to bumble into somebody that's bigger and meaner than they are and end up in somebody's belly. And that's, uh, that's exactly what happened. Here's the uh, uh, when they died and uh, what happened to them over here. And uh, again, avian predation and uh, starvation are the important causes of death and most of it occurred before the 1st of January. The head of the barred owl here is running off the, uh, uh, off the screen a little bit. Uh, perhaps you can uh, uh, lower it a little bit just to get a, get a shot of the head here. Uh, this is the uh, critter you've got here. Uh, it's another Strix owl, Strix varia. Uh, spotted owl is Strix occidentalis. Uh, up until about 1960, the western edge of the distribution of the barred owl was in western Montana. Uh, it started to move shortly after that. Uh, for comparison here, this is the, uh, this is the spotted, uh, the very spotted breast as opposed to the streaked breast, uh, a um, beak that is uh, uh, fairly dark in color uh, in comparison to the uh, to the barred owl. The barred owl's got a kind of a bright yellow beak, uh, very streaked breast. Uh, it uh, has, both of them have dark eyes. That's it, I'll stay away from that one now. Uh, the um, barred owl uh, moved across southern British Columbia or across British Columbia and arrived in the Vancouver, BC area by about 1970. Uh, by 1970, between 1970 and 79, it spread south along the Cascades and also south here in eastern Washington and Oregon. Uh, a really remarkably fast range expansion. Not man-assisted, but we suspect that it was what we were doing to the habitat. Something had to change to prompt this uh, range expansion that occurred. By 1985, uh, the barred owl had uh, moved way down into Northern California, uh, really moving, moving fast. Uh, here's about the distribution of the barred owl at the current time in uh, Western US. Got another slide that kind of overlaps uh, barred owl sightings in the uh, home in, within the range of the Northern spotted owl. And it's getting pretty close to being distributed throughout. The uh, barred owl tends to be, um, what well, not tends to be, is a little bit larger than the spotted owl. It uh, is not as specific in its habitat uh, predilections. It'll occupy uh, a broader range of habitats. It uh, has a uh, more Catholic uh, prey uh, selection. It, it takes a little bit of uh, most everything. It's uh, a considerably more diurnal. Uh, than is the uh, spotted owl, and as a result, you're adding up to something that's uh, just a little bit better competitor than we'd judge the spotted owl to be. Uh, in fact, when you have uh, encounters between the two species that folks have been able to uh, observe, and if you were to score those encounters, almost invariably it's going to be scored with the barred owl as being the winner in, in an encounter doesn't, you know, kind of another insult coming in uh, on top of the spot at all. Uh, this past year, we've uh, documented uh, four cases of uh, interbreeding between the uh, spotted owl and the barred owl. Uh, people get very concerned when that's mentioned, and I think it is uh, cause for, um, 
for concern, but, but not for alarm. Uh, I would have expected that the uh, chance for hybridization should have been greatest early on in the process. Uh, 20 years ago, when these species first came into contact, should have been when the uh, barred owls were in the shortest supply and they should have been uh, most want to uh, interbreed with spotted owls. Now, they're uh, fairly well distributed through the, through the range, and I would think that there ought to be less chance for that occurring. However, this year is the first year that we've documented it, and uh, there's four instances of uh, hybridization. Uh, we're just going to have to wait and see how that uh, pans out. We'll uh, show you a, a couple other uh, uh, photographs of some spotted owl habitat. This is not the northern spotted owl, this is the Mexican spotted owl in Arizona. Uh, there, uh, the canyon walls, the uh, vertical structure provided by canyons seems to replace, at least in part, the uh, depth of the canopy and the structure that's provided by the old trees in the northwest. Uh, those caves that you saw in the previous picture, here's somebody standing in the bottom of it, uh, that provides pretty good thermal cover uh, for the animal. There's also uh, bats in there. Spotted owls are, uh, will be very happy to eat a bat, thank you. Again, we're coming back to uh, the Redwood area uh, near Arcata, California. Uh, these little patches of trees, redwoods and uh, mixtures of hardwoods and some dug firs thrown in there, were supporting spotted owls. How well they were doing, remember, we don't know, but they were there. I had an opportunity to look at some spotted owl habitat in the state of Chihuahua, Mexico this summer. Uh, this is taken in the uh, far southwestern corner of the state of Chihuahua, probably about 150 miles uh, southwest of the city of Chihuahua. Uh, interestingly, the uh, tree species that, that were present were remarkably similar to those in the northwest. We had ponderosa pine, some uh, other, other pines uh, that I was not familiar with, uh, oaks, that's a component in the, uh, in the Northwest. We had uh, Douglas fir, we had true fir, uh, we had uh, madrones. Uh, here's a dandy big old madrone. How old do you suppose that might be? Uh, we had, of all things, red alder uh, present in uh, that far south. I was, I was kind of amazed at the uh, uh, very s similar array of tree species that were present uh, at that extreme southern part of the range of the animal. Guess what's happening in Mexico? <laughs> the uh, trucks aren't as shiny and uh, the logs aren't quite as big, but uh, uh, forests are being harvested and I suspect that the, uh, uh, the animal faces uh, similar sorts of problems uh, in, in Mexico in the long run. Although at the current time, I couldn't say that any of us were alarmed at the, the rate of harvest that we were seeing and how it was uh, impacting uh, owl habitat. There was much more selective harvest than uh, clear cut sort of approach to things. We're revisiting an uh, old forest in Oregon just to refresh you with what the real stuff looks like. This is, uh, this is where the, uh, uh, the concern for the critter centers at the, at the present time. Big tall trees, really big ones. The owl isn't the only critter that's out there in the forest and uh, I think we all recognize that the owl has been used as a, as a surrogate, as a, a front uh, animal, front person for the larger issue of old growth forests in the Northwest. This is a list from some years ago of species that were suspected to find their optimum habitat in old forests. I think it, uh, it basically holds. Uh, the pileated woodpecker certainly finds fine habitat there, but it certainly uh, is not a, a uh, uh, old growth obligate sort of species. Perhaps the uh, northern spotted owl and the bald eagle, and uh, bald eagle using old trees as a nest site, are the two that come closest uh, to obligate status. There's uh, also one other, and that's the uh, marbled murelet, which this is not, this is the pileated. Bald eagles. There's the marbled murelet, that little robin sized uh, alcid that uh, nests in the top of big old growth trees sometimes as far as 35 miles inland. It, uh, that, the chick that's uh, produced there, number one, it's got to stick it out on a, a pretty narrow branch way up in a tree. 
the adults are flying in from the ocean, uh, perhaps as far as 35 miles to feed them with a fish. The first flight that youngster has got to make is 35 miles to the ocean. If it doesn't make it, it's dead. Uh, it doesn't seem like a real s swift life history strategy to go out on, but that's, that's what it is. Uh, some, some different sorts of critters in these woods. There's the, um, uh, the actual nest site of a marble murelet. There are 23 tree nest sites of the marble murelet known worldwide. Uh, we got about 15 of them this year. Uh, it's been a real uphill struggle to try and get uh, uh, our biological hands on this critter. We're just beginning to learn how to do it. Back to the spot at all. We're going to shift gears here now and uh, talk about some of the politics. If, if you let this stuff get real serious, uh, you can get pretty serious about it. And uh, I think all of us that have been involved try and keep some level of a sense of humor, even when what we, what we see happening around us is uh, uh, not the way we feel it should be or the, perhaps the way the law suggests that it should be. I don't know if you can read this, but obviously this is uh, some bureaucrat sitting at his big desk and he's got his array of specialists here and it's uh, try again boys uh, this has visibility and credibility but it still lacks deniability and that unfortunately uh, was too often the case in the way the uh, agencies and uh, have have handled the spotted owl issue it's been less than a forthright handling of the issue let me go back and we're going to hold here just on a pretty picture of a spotted owl and I need to review with you just a little bit some of the uh, history of the uh, politics of this situation if you will or the, uh, the the background legislative background of the situation 1973 is an important date uh, Endangered Species Act very very powerful piece of legislation and it's the one that has caused the, the owl to get front page uh, uh, news it's uh, the owl is being used because it is a candidate for endangered status or is listed now as threatened and that uh, allows us to uh, manage habitat for it. Also in 1973, because of the passage of the Endangered Species Act, uh, uh, state wildlife agencies didn't uniformly respond positively to that piece of uh, legislation. Very often state agencies are very jealous of their prerogatives to manage their wildlife and they don't want the feds butting in. Uh, such was the case in Oregon. Uh, John McKean was the director of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife at the time, and he said, hey, we don't want the feds butting in and uh, taking over management of our wildlife, and we're going to form an endangered species task force, and that group is going to do their level best to prevent any other animals from getting on that list. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with all of his objectives, but certainly uh, the one to try and prevent animals from joining the list of threatened and endangered species was, was a laudable one. Uh, the spotted owl was selected as the first candidate to try and uh, prevent from becoming uh, listed. That was in 1973, and we've been working to try and prevent that listing from then until now, and I guess uh, as of uh, last year it can be said that we failed because it got listed. In 1976, uh, the National Forest Management Act was passed. It's also an important piece of federal legislation from the standpoint it did two things. It gave the Forest Service specific direction, don't create any more endangered species, and you must keep all your native wildlife well distributed on your forests. And that well distributed part of it is an addition to the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act is silent on the point of distribution of animals and the National Forest Management Act or the regulations pursuant thereto are specific on that point. By 1977, the Oregon, initial Oregon Spotted Owl Management Plan had been devised. Uh, it provided to attempt to maintain some 400 pairs of spotted owls distributed throughout the range of the species in Oregon. We suggested that uh, 300 acres be maintained around the activity centers of each of these owls. We didn't have any radio telemetry data at the time. Nobody could imagine that a little brown bird about so high could possibly require more than about 300 acres 
of this big old trees. Well, guess what? We were wrong. Uh, not the first time, and I suspect it won't be the last time. Uh, by 1981, we had some of Eric Forsman's initial radio telemetry data, and that indicated that the minimum amount of old growth forest that we had detected to that point within the home range of a pair of spotted owls was a thousand acres. That was the minimum amount that had been detected. The mean was something on the order of 2,500 acres. The new plan called for the minimum, thousand acres. I think it's important to recognize that through this whole period and up until last year or the year before last, all the direction from the agencies had been to provide the minimum amount of habitat required to support the minimum number of birds that would keep it off an endangered species list. And we're dealing with this uh, minimum basis. By 1987, the Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned by an outfit called Green World, not Greenpeace, but Green World, to list the northern spotted owl as threatened. In December of 1987, the Fish and Wildlife Service completed a status review and judged that listing of the owl was not warranted. That was appealed by the Seattle Audubon Society, and I think they were joined by several other environmental groups. It was reviewed by the Federal District Court in Seattle. The judge there found that the Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, decision was arbitrary and capricious. He wrote a really tough letter to the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, essentially, essentially taking them to the woodshed and giving them a good dressing down and say, hey, go back and read the report your biologist turned in, and you tell me how after reading that report you come to the conclusion that listing is not warranted. Another status review team was formed. Another review was accomplished. This gets back to the credibility, deniability part of things. Uh, that group brought in a finding, and this time the Fish and Wildlife Service agreed that listing as threatened was warranted. That was 1989. About this time, uh, the environmental community began laying bunches of injunctions on timber sales. And they essentially brought the harvest of timber to a virtual standstill through interaction with uh, court processes in the Northwest. In 1989, the Congress made a last attempt to put a fix on things in what was known as Section 318 or the Hatfield, uh, excuse me, the Hatfield Adams Amendment to the Interior and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill. That amendment reduced the sim timber sale volume by about 10%. It increased the number of protected owl pairs by about 10% and barred appeals of sales for sales that were uh, uh, created under the aegis of this uh, Section 318 for that particular year. That's the last time that there's been intervention by Congress in, in trying to work with uh, uh, the old growth issue in the Northwest. That was 1989. Obviously, things were not going well, and uh, the agency uh, directors uh, recognized this, and in the fall of 18, 1989, they uh, attempted a, another maneuver. Well, before we get into that other maneuver, here is the uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Status Review, the final one that was accomplished in uh, 1990. Uh, we've got to show this someplace. This is uh, on the basis of this, the Fish and Wildlife Service made a final decision and at, in uh, June of uh, 1990 listed the animal a, as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Perhaps the most telling piece of information that I think is contained in that status review is this graph. Um, Pacific Northwest region of the U.S. Forest Service. Not all the lands in the Northwest, but the Pacific Northwest region in spotted owl habitat. Acres and millions, that's acres of old growth forest. This is old growth forest that is in a non-reserve status. Those were the acres that were free and available for timber harvest. 
So it does not include the wilderness acres of old growth forest. It does not include those that were withdrawn for, uh, because the slopes were too steep, or that were drawn for uh, pine marten protection, pileated woodpecker protection, those sorts of withdrawals. It's what was available for harvest. What's happened to that? Well, it's been declining, folks, and it's been declining at virtually a precipitous rate, and it doesn't take a whole lot to project that, hey, if we keep on going like we're going, we're going to be out in a very short time. And that, I think, is a pretty persuasive piece of evidence. These were the agencies that uh, formed together in 1989 and asked a group of uh, six scientists to address this. Uh, charge was to develop a scientifically credible conservation strategy for the northern spotted owl. Uh, there were six of us involved. In addition, there were another 11 folks that joined us from, uh, the six of us were all federal wildlife biologists. The other 11 that joined with us were represented the states of Oregon and Washington, California. They represented some conservation organizations, in this case the Wilderness Society. They represented the timber industry. Uh, they represented the Park Service. So that there was a wide uh, variety of individuals that joined in this effort. Six of us, however, had to sign the document. This is what was produced. Some of you have seen it. The artwork is the, the same one that's used on the, uh, on the cover for uh, tonight's uh, uh, talk. We'll try a little bit more humor here. Uh, how do you tell a spotted bio owl biologist? This is the, the group on the ISC committee. Pretty simple. They all got their hands in their pockets. <laughs> okay, our, our leader is not in the, in the photograph. You need to know a little bit about the uh, leadership on this effort. Uh, Dr. Jack Ward Thomas, a Forest Service research biologist at La Grande, Oregon, uh, was the uh, team chairman. Uh, Jack uh, did a I believe a truly outstanding job, not only in holding 17 uh, diverse individuals together for six months and, and driving a product out of us, uh, he also was exceedingly instrumental in making effective presentations to Congress and all the uh, organizations uh, affected by uh, spotted owls. So we have to have a picture of Jack. <laughs> Jack doesn't know, uh, would uh, uh, vociferously proclaimed that he doesn't know or didn't know a lot about spotted owls when he got into this. So obviously when you're just learning to be a spotted owl biologist, you're just attempting to get your hands in your pockets. <laughs> anyway, I need uh, the uh, next uh, set of slides. Uh, I, I think all of us on that committee and uh, those that appreciate the effort that went into that uh, report owe Jack a uh, uh, he really provided a strong leadership role. The uh, plan that was uh, presented uh, involved or was based on uh, five uh, basic concepts. Uh, these are uh, recognized uh, wildly, wide, widely, not wildly, uh, in the field of conservation biology and uh, they're not exactly uh, rocket science sort of concepts. They're, they're pretty straightforward, and I suspect all of us in this room could have uh, thought them up all by ourselves if we just thought about it for a while. Uh, pretty obvious that if you have maintain an animal well distributed, it's a whole lot better off than if you chunk it up in little pieces and keep it separated. Large habitat blocks with many pairs of animals are obviously going to be better than small blocks with few pairs. Habitat blocks close together are better than those that are farther apart. This is pretty simplistic sort of stuff. Less fragmented habitat, more, that is more contiguous, is better than more fragmented. Finally, habitat blocks that are well connected are better than blocks that are not. There are all kind of variations on a theme and it's uh, the, the connectedness and the, uh, uh, the size, big is better in most cases here. This is uh, an example of a, um, again, of one of the uh, new perspectives in forestry uh, treatments of a uh, landscape or of a cut unit. And uh, I suspect that this will provide uh, very considerably better habitat for almost all wildlife in about 60 or 70 years. It's not an instant solution to the problem now, certainly. 
Uh, we'll let you kind of rest your eyes on that, and I'll try and describe what we tried to accomplish in this uh, uh, interagency scientific committee report. The first thing that we did was to establish a set of habitat conservation areas. They were, were to be sufficient in size to each accommodate, ideally, about 20 pairs of owls. There is to be no extraction of timber for any commercial reason from within those areas. These, uh, the, uh, the areas that are not old forest are to be allowed to proceed through succession and become older, eventually growing into old growth forest. The HCAs are based only on federal land and are distributed throughout the range of the northern spotted owl at about a 12 mile spacing. The 20 mile, the, excuse me, the 20 pair uh, estimate was based on empirical data on the persistence of island populations of similar birds and on the results of modeling of spotted owl populations. We expect that on the order of 17 of those 20 pairs would be present at any one time in an HCA. You make it big enough for 20, but we really expect that any one time probably only about 17 would be there. The HCAs in Washington, Oregon, and California are sufficient to accommodate about 2,200 pairs of spotted owls. Currently, we estimate the mapped HCAs currently support about 1,750 pairs. That's what we estimate are in those areas now. They will support more pairs when the cutover areas within them grow up. That targeted number of pairs, 2,200, represents a 40 to 60 percent reduction in the numbers of current, or in the current numbers of spotted owls. There's nothing particularly special about the landscapes currently within those HCAs, except that they were designed to capture existing reserved areas as much as possible. We tried to center them or base them on wilderness areas that had suitable spotted owl habitat so that we took advantage of existing reserved areas. The location of the HCAs was driven mostly by the spacing criteria. Remember that slide on dispersal distances of young owls? We selected a distance that 66% or two-thirds of the young owls seemed capable of, of making. That was 12 miles. That's what drove the spacing between those HCAs. We could find no convincing evidence that dispersal corridors, that's another real buzzword in uh, ecological literature and thought at the present time, we could find no evidence that dispersal corridors would be effective for spotted owls. Therefore, we devised a minimum set of management criteria for the intervening federal lands between the HCAs. Again, just federal lands. The intent was to provide sufficient habitat quality on these intervening lands so that the dispersing juveniles had a reasonable chance of surviving as they moved from their natal site and hopefully encounter another uh, set of suitable habitats. We do not count on these intervening lands to provide a persistent population of owls. This prescription that resulted has come to be known as a 50-11-40 rule. That I think I can explain. On each quarter township of land, that's an area three miles by three miles in size, is to be managed by the land managing agency involved so that 50% of that area, three miles by three miles, is in trees that are larger than 11 inches dbh and with a greater than 40% canopy closure. So you're saying that, you know, we want trees that big around with a reasonable level of canopy closure on half, at least half the lands in each quarter township. That's a condition that is easily achieved by half, uh, at, at the half point of about a 60 to 80 year rotation in the Douglas fir zone. So if the Forest Service is managing on a 60 to 80 year rotation, they should be able to easily achieve that prescription in that uh, time frame. There are 7.7 .7 million acres included in these HCAs. 5.8 million of those are um, outside of wilderness or parks. And uh, of that 5.8 million acres, 20 to 30 percent are not in the timber base. So that about four million acres of these uh, blue areas here are coming out of the timber base. What is the timber 
I, I better uh, defer from answering you on that. I'm, I'm afraid I'd give you the, the, wrong, uh, the wrong number here. It's going to be, um, let's see, probably on, on the order of about 20 million acres, I would judge, someplace in that vicinity. I think what we have uh, outlined here in these HCAs is about a, uh, is, uh, about a 5.8 million and there's probably at least uh, four times as, as much outside those areas within uh, ownership of the federal agencies. This is uh, the, uh, the purple areas are uh, HCAs in the state of Oregon. You can see how they're spaced out on a pretty regular basis. Uh, those that are uh, adjacent to wilderness areas attempt to take advantage of those wilderness areas in the process. Oregon has perhaps the uh, most uniform distribution of forests uh, of the three states involved and the pattern here is the uh, most ideal. This is closest to what we would have liked to see uh, the pattern develop as. Uh, state of Washington isn't quite as pretty. You hit some problems up there. The uh, Olympic Peninsula, for instance, has got uh, Puget Sound and the Seattle metropolitan area and uh, environs separating any owls here from owls in the Cascades, uh, it's pretty hard to get them across there. There's a couple proposed HCAs here that are based on state lands and uh, we don't know if the states will wish to participate in this or not. Uh, our plan was to have something that would be sufficient using, excuse me, only federal lands. California again is uh, presents some uh, some differences as you get towards the extremes of the uh, range of the animal it, it's more difficult to create these 20 pair HCAs and we've got to settle for much smaller ones this is not ideal but it's the best that we could accomplish um, this plan was presented to uh, Congress uh, Forest Service uh, kind of adopted it as an interim measure until they um, have a chance to uh, work through a uh, NEPA approved process to adopt a permanent spotted owl management plan. The, uh, I think they said that they will manage not inconsistently with this, this plan. I didn't, it's, there's some question as to just how that might be interpreted. Uh, the BLM has uh, said uh, they will stay out of the HCAs, but they're not going to respect the 50-11-40 rule. That if they did that, that would cause them to have to cease harvest. They're um, very far along in their timber harvest program, and it, uh, we agree that if they followed the 50-11-40 rule, they would uh, essentially be uh, shut down in those intervening lands. A lot of noise about this. Uh, I guess you can. Uh, read part of the noise by what you see in the papers. This was about the time the article in, you know, hit Time magazine. Uh, it's uh, front page uh, news on, uh, regularly in the uh, Oregonian, the other major newspapers in the area. In May of this year, uh, four folks, Jack Ward Thomas, John Gordon, who used to be on the forestry faculty here, uh, Jerry Franklin, a respected Forest Service ecologist, and Norm Johnson, an economist with uh, the uh, uh, Oregon State University, were asked by Congress to devise a, uh, a plan that would uh, accommodate not only uh, uh, spotted owls, but also would accommodate some of the other values associated with old growth forests. This was the first time Congress is intervening and stepping out and getting beyond just the owl issue. Uh, here's what uh, an, a, they, these four uh, gentlemen assembled about 150 folks to help them do some mapping and they came up with a series of alternatives that uh, step up in their levels of protection for the various values starting with a high timber option and, and proceeding uh, down and in each step adding uh, more protection. The impact on the allowable sale quantity of timber is shown here. The estimated uh, job loss here and the probability of sustaining these uh, functions is uh, indicated VL is very low, uh, medium, 
and high are the uh, other ones you can interpret for yourself. Boy, I'm having trouble getting that. Um, anyway, um, the high timber option is uh, essentially maintaining harvest at the sort of rate that was being experienced in the 1980 to 89 period. When you invoke the currently in place forest management plans that are approved by the Forest Service, if you didn't do anything but just put in place what's currently there, this is what you would have. The sale quantity would drop to 3 billion board feet. You'd lose 20 to 26,000 jobs in the process. That, in fact, has already occurred or is in the process of occurring. If to those forest plans you add the ISC plan that I've just been describing that then takes those forest plans and, if you will, makes them sufficient for owls, you increase the job loss to 35 to 40,000 souls, the allowable sale quantity drops again. Here's where you start to see some of the other uh, factors kick in. When you save enough for owls, forest plans, etc., and then save the best examples of old growth forest such that you have at least a moderate chance of retaining a functional old growth system and high chance of retaining owls and many of these other values, uh, you, uh, you drop the uh, sale quantity that's available, increase the job losses. If you add fish habitat, you boost it again. If you add more old growth, you boost it once again. This information has been presented to Congress. Uh, they're in the process of mulling over that. There are several uh, bills in front of Congress, ranging from uh, essentially those that would espouse something uh, uh, at least as um, timber intensive as the forest plans, probably hoping that a little bit more might be uh, harvested, to uh, some that uh, would probably be down in this sort of range at least. Uh, where it's going to shake out, uh, kind of, uh, it depends. We're, uh, we're at <coughs> the, uh, another important point, I think, in that uh, the uh, director of the Bureau of Land Management, Mr. Cy Jamison, uh, asked uh, his boss, Secretary Lujan, Secretary of the Interior, to convene the God Squad on this issue. Some uh, 50 of uh, 150 sales proposed by the uh, Bureau of Land Management uh, were found by uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to jeopardize the owl. That's a formal call that says, hey, you cut those and uh, you are seriously uh, impacting the continued ability of this animal to persist. Uh, Mr. Jameson is simply saying, hey, uh, my agency uh, can't withstand a uh, timber cutback of of that magnitude and uh, maintain our, our role as it has traditionally been, I want the God Squad in and try and factor economics into this. Um, Mr. Uh, Lujan has, I believe, 20 days uh, to respond. If the God Squad is invoked, uh, it's a fairly lengthy process and it uh, could uh, go on for on the order of 18 months before a decision might be reached. I believe that uh, instead what we're about to see is uh, Congress uh, step in in some uh, pretty effective fashion or to do something to attempt to resolve this by uh, probably drawing some lines on some maps, uh, setting up some interim uh, management areas for old growth and other values, uh, to call for some additional research and uh, attempt to also in the process set some minimum level of timber harvest so that uh, some semblance of, uh, of uh, life as uh, used to be normal can continue in the Northwest. Um, it's kind of a, uh, uh, just a wild guess uh, as to where we may go from here. And perhaps the owl knows, perhaps he doesn't. Um, I guess in, uh, in summary, I was reviewing uh, Dr. Arrington's book on predation and life, and I think uh, one, one phrase, one uh, idea uh, caught me and uh, stuck with me, and I, I thought uh, was very, uh, very cogent to this point and uh, I'd leave you with that. Uh, whether predator or prey, animals cannot be expected to live where they do not belong. 
And I think that summarizes a, a lot of the, the problems that people perceive with the spotted owl. Whether predator or prey, animals cannot be expected to live where they do not belong. I think the owl is where it is because it's the owl and we're going to have to uh, either manage to provide it with uh, the sort of habitat that it needs or we're going to have to face the uh, probability that uh, we'll lose it. Thank you. <laughs>